Hello, I'm Robin Vinton and welcome to Surface Sessions. Today, we're looking at how well Cubase 9.5 runs on the Surface Pro 2017. Now, I did a video back last summer all about the audio performance of the Surface Pro 2017. And in it, I believe I proved that the Surface Pro is completely capable of running a small studio setup. It will run Pro Tools, Cubase, Reaper, Ableton, Bitwig, whatever you like. It can do the job with the right amount of tweaking and the right amount of love, care and attention. But what I want to do in this series of videos is take each of those doors and just spend a little bit more time with them to do some performance testing. Yeah, sure, because versions have changed, versions of Windows have changed. I want to sort of update the knowledge base on that. But also I want to look at how well the workflow works in this sort of hybrid touch environment. I want to see how well the pen works, how well the dial works, if at all, and how suitable the door in question is for making music on the surface. Can you do it? Is it possible? Is it easy? Does the workflow enhance and help anything? Or is it just like any other laptop? In the process of that, I'll be looking with a bit more detail into the audio engine, how you set that up, how you use an audio interface, how you use the onboard sound, if there are any specific tweaks that you need to do to the Surface Pro to get the best out of it. I'll be doing some testing on audio performance and also the sort of polyphony you can get out of it using virtual instruments. And I will round it all off by making some music. So that's the plan. I hope to cover all of the doors I can get my hands on, but this particular one at this time is Cubase Pro 9.5. And if you're interested in a more general overview of how the Surface Pro 2017 works with a whole range of doors, then do check out my audio performance video from last year. A few words about the setup here. This is the Surface Pro 2017 model, Core i5, eight gigabytes of RAM. It's also fanless, which is very, very cool. Now you may have a different version. You may have a Surface Book, a Surface Book 2, I don't know, all I can show you is what I have. And you have to use this to try to decide whether your system is comparable to that or better or worse. I have here a USB audio interface, the Avid Fast Track Duo, which is my standard test device. It's not anything special or exciting, but it works and it does the job. Over here, I've got a MIDI keyboard, the Base Station 2, which I'm not using the sounds of, I'm just purely using it as a MIDI controller via USB into the Surface Pro. To connect these things up, I'm using a powered USB hub over here. You can use a passive one, but I find that you tend to run into the odd problems with a passive one. So get yourself a powered hub, and that also allows me to run the Cubase dongle in there, which needs to be plugged in for it to work. So if you are looking just to take this away to do some mobile recording and just use the single, damn it, USB port, then that is gonna be filled by the Cubase dongle. That's it, you're not gonna be able to plug anything else in. So you need to have some form of USB hub in order to plug yourself in to a larger selection of gear. Right, good. Let's load up the Cubase demo song and have a little poke around. Don't spend too long listening to that, otherwise I'll be hit with copyright claims, which is always a pain in the ass. So what are we looking at here? Well, within Cubase, there's now a different way of looking at things. They've combined some windows together to make it a bit more tidy, a bit more like Studio One or some other programs, and that's no bad thing. Now you are restricted in real estate on the Surface Pro. It's got a relatively small screen when comparing it to other laptops and quite a high definition, which means things can get very small. However, the scaling in Cubase is excellent. Everything is at the right sort of size it should be. The text is readable, everything is grabbable. And so on the whole, Cubase lays itself out nicely. Things can get a little bit small in there, but you can also bring things up to full screen in order to cope with that sort of thing. For instance, if you want to deal just really with the arrange page, you can turn off the other sides of stuff and have a lot more of the arrange page on your screen. Similarly with a mixer, you can have that down at the bottom here, 
or you can have that full screen as well. In terms of scaling, I always have it set to the recommended 200%. If we can change that by sticking in scaling, and then we can change that here. So for instance, I can go all the way down to 100%. And that gives me a much larger bit of real estate to deal with, but everything is a bit weeny. I mean, it's beautifully weeny. I mean, everything is sharp and gorgeous and it looks really nice, but it's gonna start getting difficult trying to move those faders in any kind of sort of resolution. But you have a lot of space to play with if you're happy with that kind of size of menu. At the other end, you can whack it up to 300% and everything gets a bit big. You can't really deal with that, I don't think. And if I turn these other bits off, it does start getting a bit large in there. However, if you were going just purely for editing, then maybe that's a resolution you might like to put it to because it does make it a whole lot easier to see. However, with the right amount of zooming and such like within the system as a whole, you don't really need to use the scaling. Leave it at 200% and I'm sure you'll be happy with the way it moves about. Also, as you can see, the text does start to lose definition when it gets blown up like that. But on the whole, Cubase scales really, really well. The other thing Cubase does really well is respond to touch. Now, not multi-touch. It's not a multi-touch piece of software. It responds to one finger and the odd gesture. So for instance, pinch to zoom is a good old zoom in and out option. Zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. Yeah, that's, that's terribly innovative. But otherwise, navigation in the arrange page is done with these surprisingly grabbable scroll bars at the side. They made them weeny when version 9 came along, I think, and I thought that was going to make it much harder to use. But actually, you can grab those. See, I missed it. You can grab those. See, I missed it. You can grab those relatively easily and scroll around to your heart's content. And in many ways, I find that actually more natural and easier than doing some kind of three finger drag in order to move the arrange page around. I like scroll bars, they, they're useful, I know where they are, I know what to do with them, and it doesn't involve any accidental movement of data on the page. The zoom in and out controls are a whole different matter though. They are tiny and down here, and even if you do grab it, which I didn't, even if you do grab it, oh, it tends to, to leap because it's only got a very small area in which to move, and so you very quickly get yourself you know, not exactly where you want to be. So to be able to zoom vertically would be very useful, but we don't have that option currently with touch. Getting a pen involved there at that point makes that a whole lot easier. So I've got a lot more control, precise control, when I've got the pen involved. It's also the pen that gives you the best control over individual clips within the arrange page. Because as I hover the pen, the handles appear for various things. So the handles for um, gain or volume control, the handles for fades, and also the handles for trimming works very nicely. And these of course are harder to grab with your finger. Not impossible, but harder to do so. See, that's not working, I'm just moving it about. But moving about is, is easy. That can, you can just click on it anywhere, tap on it anywhere and you can move stuff about very easy, but hitting those, there we go, hitting those handles can be a bit of a task with the finger. Still doable, just not as easy as with the pen. Now, of course, on the Surface Pro, I have the keyboard attached and I've got a trackpad and I've got a keyboard and I can use the mouse here and I can use keyboard shortcuts, just like any idiot using any computer. I can do that, that's fine. However, I like to push the idea that touch and the pen offers a different way of working and that you kind of need to release yourself from the trackpad and the keyboard and sort of enter into touch to really benefit from it. There's a few things you can do. You can do it in a hybrid way. You can do a bit here, a bit there, a bit here, a bit there. And that's fine. That works very well. But yeah, I would encourage people to generally look into using the pen more, using your fingers more, generally within door software because it offers a different creative approach. And personally, a different creative approach is always what I'm after because it affects the way I make music and ultimately affects what I create. 
And so if I can funnel my creativity through more than just a single point on a touchpad or a single point on a mouse, then that's interesting to me. That's exciting to me. That's enabling me to engage with a piece of software to a much greater degree than a mouse or trackpad allows. But that brings some challenges. What sort of challenges does it bring? Simple challenges, stupidly simple challenges. So if I ignore the keyboard, if I assume that I've taken that off and thrown that away and I'm just using the tablet, how do I copy and paste something? Hmm? How do you do that? How do you loop around a clip? How do I do that? See, simple things. So let me pick something like this lurking thing here. I want to copy and paste that. Now to do that without using a keyboard shortcut is a bit laborious. I can tap and hold to get the right click up, but it doesn't do anything in Cubase Pro. It brings up the toolbar. I mean, okay, that can be useful for deleting things or adding new things, but it's no good for a simple copy and paste. Okay, then I'll go to edit, uh, copy. Yeah, good, then stick where I want it to go, edit, paste. Yes, that works, of course that works, but that's a little bit long-winded, don't you think? Yes, yeah, so what am I trying to get at? Well, what I'm trying to get at is that there's something sorely missing in the workflow when using the pen and touch on the Microsoft Surface Pro. The problem is the lack of any kind of customizable toolbar. What do I mean? Well, what I would like myself, what I would like very, very much would be just a simple, bunch of keyboard shortcuts. It's like having a customizable on-screen keyboard, you know, and, and I could do things with here. I can do oh, control, copy, control, paste, but that's still a bit annoying. What I would like would be able to create some customizable keys, some keyboard shortcuts that are just triggered just by touching them, a customizable macro toolbar. That's the sort of thing that I'm after, but sadly, Windows does not provide it. Neither does Cubase. Some pieces of software like Bitwig, for instance, allow you to put lots of commands in a toolbar on the top. That's brilliant. Studio One also does that. Awesome. Again, something that I can touch quickly with my fingers so that I don't have to go into menus in order to do simple things. Is there a solution? Yes, there is. There is sort of a solution, something called Toolbar Creator, which I've mentioned before. I've done videos on this before, and it's worth mentioning again because it's simple and brilliant. And it does exactly what I've said. It creates a little toolbar so you can do simple or actually really advanced tasks. Here is my toolbar made in Toolbar Creator. Simply got move so I can move it about, hide at the other end so I can make it go away, but I've got copy, paste, undo, duplicate, loop, and mixer. That's it. You can make this as big and as complex as you like, filled with all sorts of interesting keyboard shortcuts and commands. Brilliant, but in Cubase, all I want is something simple that I can use to combine with the touch interface. So for instance, if I want to copy and paste something, grab hold of that and press copy, paste where I want it to go, paste, and it's there. It's that simple. I did it, you weren't even looking, you probably missed it. So I could try, for instance, duplicate, 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 duplicate. I could go undo, 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 undo. Simple, brilliant, that's all I want. Something that quick, that simple that I don't have to drop back to the keyboard to do keyboard shortcuts here, because I may not have the keyboard attached. It may be somewhere else. I may be using purely touch, purely the pen, and I want a quick way of working and flowing through Cubase. And the toolbar does that. It's awesome. It's something that should be in Windows. So if anybody knows anyone at Microsoft, yeah. Toolbar Creator is available from the link down in the description. One tip I will give you is that Steinberg seemed to have done something slightly odd to the key commands. By that I mean it doesn't seem to receive modifier keys from an external source like it used to. So in Toolbar Creator, when you create the shortcut for copy and paste, Control C, Control V, it does not compute <laughs> for some reason. It doesn't work. So you have to make a slight adjustment, which is if you're in Toolbar Creator, you'll know what I'm talking about, you change it to a timed toggle. Set that to 200 milliseconds and it works perfectly. I don't know why that is. The developer of Toolbar Creator doesn't really know why that is either. Now that also has something to say about the surface dial. I did a video about Cubase and the surface dial a little while ago, and in it I showed some things working and some things not working very well. And the reason for that, I think, going on my experience with the Toolbar Creator is probably to do with those modifier keys again, because I had all sorts of trouble getting those to work with the surface dial. So there's something in Steinberg that is 
has done something weird to using some other external way, other than a QWERTY keyboard, to fire off those commands. I'm not sure what that is at present. If I get a chance, I'll look into it a bit further. But let's now look at the mixer. I've also, on my little toolbar here, got a mixer button. Hit that. The mixer is awesome in Cubase 9.5. It's got a lot of stuff involved in there. I'm going to get rid of that now. Uh, but one finger on a fader works perfectly in Cubase. No problem. No problem to anything. All the buttons work, mute and solo and such like. They're all touchable. It's all good. You can change the size. If I can remember how. There, is it? Yeah, there we go. So you can make things a bit chunkier if you want, which also perhaps gives you better access to uh, things like the EQ and effects. One of the nice things is the, the way that it works in Cubase is that you can tap and move your finger away and then move from side to side. So you can always see the parameter you're trying to affect rather than having to press on a knob and sort of turn it with your finger where you can't actually see what you're doing. But that, good, I can move it, easy. Pan, do the same, where is it there? Bum, 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 bum. Simple. When you get into inserts, start messing around with effects. Everything, again, in Cubase is nice and easy to touch. Turn things on, turn things off, move knobs around. Excellent. If I want to insert an effect, I can just tap, go down to EQ, for instance, stick in the new one, frequency. There it is. EQ is always very enjoyable to use with your fingers because I can put that in like so or I can change it on the knobs over here. Brilliant, lovely, love all of that. I can also do it with more accuracy perhaps with the pen. So I think overall what I'm trying to show you is that the, the touch elements within Cubase are as excellent as you're going to get on a single touch environment. For a piece of software that's not designed specifically for touch, it works without any fuss, without any bother, without any tripping up and down. If you can get your fingers in there, you can change a parameter. And that's really all I ask from a piece of software, is for it not to put anything in the way of using a single finger or a pen in order to change things and mess things around. You'll be surprised at how many bits of software do sort of foil that whole idea. But Cubase, awesome. Works very well. So just to round this off with the dial again, just to mention it, what you can do is you can set up a little sort of custom controller strip so that you can use the, the wheel with the application. If I bring up the wheel settings, I can show you that you create uh, a little app tool. So I've got Cubase 9 here and I've added in some transport controls and some zoom controls. And I'll just show you what they look like. So I tap and hold down, are you seeing that? Yes and I can select transport controls. There we go, number one. So if I press down on it now, that should kick off playback. It does, let's come back where the music is. And stop. Is that cool? Yeah, kind of. And then I've got scrub forward and scrub back. Sort of. <laughs> See, it doesn't really work because of what the Surface Dart is doing. It's not holding down a key, I don't think. It's doing something else. So for instance, I've got it mapped to these two keys here. So it should be doing that. And that the other way. But it doesn't really do that. Right, let's try another one. I've set it up to be zoom. Where is it? There. This is a bit more straightforward. I turn it, it zooms in. Turn it, zooms in. If I hold shift, it then zooms up and down like that. Now that is actually remarkably handy, particularly if you're using touch. So you can just sit there, lean back a little bit and zoom in and out of what you want to see. So there, look, I found a use for the surface dial. Also, it's transport at the same time. If you have a quick look at the editing with the pen or with the finger, if you select, for instance, a MIDI clip and then bring up the editor, that divider can sometimes be a little bit hard to find. There you go. See, I can zoom in and out with my wheel. 
<laughs> that's nice. Uh, within the editor, it's simply a matter of choosing the pen tool and I can draw in whatever I like. I can also, as I've drawn it in, go up and down in order to set the velocity, which is quite nice. Or if I want to bring out the velocity pane, I can also draw in there. I can also do that with my finger, but it's slightly less precise, I suppose. But I can always zoom in a little bit in order to make that work exactly as I want it to. Talking of editing, I can also do automation control. I've got volume here. I can select a, a pen tool and I can draw that straight in. Just like that. Now, the pen for automation drawing is sublime. Absolutely sublime. You have far better control than you would ever do with a mouse, I believe. Easy, and then editing is similarly easy, or drawing in curves, whatever it is you want to do. So all this touch business, the pen business, the dial business, the toolbar, all of this adds something to the way that you work with Cubase. It changes something. And that for me is a good thing. If I'm using something the same all the time, I tend to drop into the same habits, the same way of doing things and produce the same sort of thing. Whereas once I've been given a tool to do something slightly differently, it evolves the way that I work with a piece of software. And that's something that I really, really like. Right, let's have a look at the whole audio engine situation. Now, I always, always, always recommend using an external USB audio interface when making music with the Surface. However, I've come to understand that many, many people out there just want to use it as it is. They just want to use a headphone output and they want to mix and make music without having to fuss around with external peripherals. That's all fine, but there are reasons why I recommend the USB audio interface. It just makes life simpler. Well, and also more complicated because you've got to carry an extra piece of gear with you. But the main reasons, let me try and big up the idea of an audio interface. The reasons why you want an audio interface, a USB audio interface, are physicality to start with. You've got proper connections. You can plug a microphone in here, you can phantom power it, you can plug a guitar in here, headphones, you've got individual controls over gain, over monitoring, over headphone volume control and output volume control. It's a comprehensive solution, even in a little box like this. It's going to give you the ability to make high quality recordings, to plug everything in, and it's going to work very, very well with Cubase or your selected door. The onboard sound, not so much. I mean, obviously you can't plug anything into it. It has a microphone built in, but there's no line in. There's no way to get sound into Cubase unless, you know, I mean, if you're using purely MIDI and virtual instruments, well then yes, you do have an output through the headphone socket here on the side or through the onboard speakers, if you're really going a bit lo-fi. But all these things are possible. And I just wanted to show you how you set up both of these within Cubase to make them work the best for you. You will find the audio settings under Studio, Studio Setup, and then VST Audio System at the bottom there. I've currently got the Fast Track Duo ASIO driver loaded. Now, ASIO, A-S-I-O, it's very, very important. It stands for Audio System In-Out, and it's Steinberg's own driver protocol to allow low latency audio. What's low latency audio? Oh, well, I'm gonna demonstrate that in a second, but essentially it's the delay between, between hitting the key and hearing a sound. That is latency. That is the time it takes for the processor in your system to go, oh, a key's been pressed. Oh, I'm gonna generate some audio. Boom, I'm gonna stick it onto the output. That is latency and that can be playable more or less real time, or it can be unplayable and far too long to enable you to make any music. And what's important for me in a system like this in trying to make music is that we have very low latency while not being a drag on the processor. And an audio interface, a USB audio interface with a decent ASIO driver is going to do that. The onboard sound, not quite so much, but we'll come to that in a second. So with the, the Fast Track Duo selected, I've got good sound coming out of here. High quality to my speakers on proper jack cables, all that sort of business. And the latency is very good. I can play this in real time.
with no bother. Excellent. Now, if I switch to the onboard sound, there'll be a little bit of a difference. Now, this is now coming out of here. You can hear it crackle. Now, what you hopefully can see and here is there's a delay between striking a key and hearing a sound. It's not a massive delay, but it makes it really unplayable. It's as if I'm playing a piano that's down the other end of the hall. That's because the input output latency of using the onboard sound, the standard Windows drivers, is about 20 milliseconds. 20 milliseconds is too long. What you're always aiming for is under 10 milliseconds. For me, 10 milliseconds starts to feel like real time. That's what this is giving us. However, the standard Windows drivers are going to give us 20 milliseconds. Now, believe me, that's far better than I ever used to. It used to be standard 500 milliseconds, as in half a second. That used to be the standard latency, <laughs> the standard buffer size, the, the space of memory in which uh, Windows would give the CPU in order to process audio. In order to maintain a stable stream of audio, it would give it half a second to play with. That's why whenever you pressed play media player, it would always take half a second for the actual playback to begin. These days, it's much, much better, but it's still nowhere near real time in terms of music software. Now that's not a problem if you're just mixing, if you're just playing stuff back and, and editing. It is a problem if you're trying to play something or if you're trying to monitor through effects through software. So you're plugging your guitar in and you're trying to, to listen to that as you play and as you record. But of course there's no input to the surface without an external audio interface, so that's perhaps not an issue. But I'm just making a point. So can we do something about this? Well, luckily we can. There's a third party application called ASIO for All, and that's essentially like a wrapper for the Windows driver and fools Windows and Cubase into believing it's a proper ASIO audio interface. The result of that is that it allows it to run at lower latency and so gives us a workable solution. Let's have a look at that. So we go to my list here again and select this time ASIO for All. Now this has dropped the latency down to under 10 milliseconds, just like this. And now... It's suddenly playable. It's suddenly become playable. So this is now a low enough latency to use the onboard sound, the headphone output, properly without any bother, without any lag, without any drag. And it can actually probably go a little bit keener than that if I push it a little bit. Now let me bring up the controls for ASIO for All. It's under this little green button here. So the first thing you need to do is hit the spanner and that will bring up the advanced settings. And then you'll see these two outputs, the Realtek second output and the Realtek uh, regular output. The regular one refers to speakers, the second one refers to the headphone output. Under both of those, what you want set is that first output, the 44.1 to 48 kilohertz output. That is the one you want activated, not the other one, not the 8 to 192 kilohertz. That's really for sort of Blu-ray and DVD playback. It's not got anything to do with making music, so you need that first one selected. So just to recap that then, with ASIO for All, you download it from asioforall.com, link again in the description, download it, install it, it will find your audio drivers, you load it up in Cubase so that the control panel appears, you go to advanced, you set it to that first output, the 44.1 to 48 kilohertz output. That's the one that you want to set it to on both the second output and the first audio output driver. Yeah, are you getting all of that? Great. Now, the other slight issue is how do you swap between headphones and speakers? So, you know, you're on the bus and you're doing all your music on your Surface Pro and your mate goes, oh, well, can I have a listen? And the rest of the bus goes, yeah, we can all join in. You go, right, I'll just stick it on speakers. You unplug that, nothing happens. Hmm. 
yes what you need to do is go into connections here and under there you can set the output to the other two outputs here it's not automatic because they are separate drivers so unplugging the headphones doesn't automatically kick the speakers into being it does in windows because that's designed to do that but then your audio software you have to specify your outputs if you're using an audio interface like this it has a headphone socket on it so that's always present you've always got a line output to your speakers and a headphone socket that's one of the reasons why it's so much better however if you just swap those around then it should with a bit of luck come out of your speakers lovely and to go back to my headphones I'll go over here there's my audio connections uh, where am I? just plugging my headphones back in yeah just a minute just a minute there you go easy easy in it right performance testing then this is always the exciting bit kinda the point of this is to try to show how many plugins the surface pro can do now that's one of those sort of how long is a piece of string type questions because it depends greatly on the complexity of your project what sort of plugins you've got loaded and which plugins you want to run i mean i'm being constantly asked you know how many instances of this plugin can i run could i run 15 instances of serum could i run a whole stack of omnisphere twos could i run vienna symphonic library i don't have any idea i have no idea at all i can only tell you what i've run on this and the point of these tests is to try to give you a clue as to what your system could do or if you bought one of these how your projects are going to behave on such a system because without using your specific plugin loaded on your specific system i'm never going to know how many of those it can do so stop asking all right usually when testing audio performance one of the most useful tools is doorbench doorbench.com is a website devoted to the measurement of audio performance and latency on a whole range of audio systems and they've provided a test project which allowed you to measure your system against a load of other systems it's very very useful it's simply a whole bunch of sine waves stuck into a project with a bunch of effects on it and you keep adding effects until your system crackles when it crackles come back a little bit till you've got stable playback and there that is your benchmark number it's probably more complicated than that but that's the simplistic way that i use it uh, that can be very useful but it's also not particularly musical because we tend to be using many different things when we're making music on a system so i like to do my own tests as well i use a polyphony test i create a very simple range of notes which i play through a whole bunch of different virtual instruments in order to see what sort of polyphony i can get out of the system as a whole and i think that gives quite a good indication of what your system could do in a realistic setting so that's what i'm going to use I'm going to use doorbench which you can download from doorbench.com link in the description as ever and then i'll do a polyphony test which you can do yourself at home you can just set that up and give yourself a comparison to what i'm doing here before we start these performance tests there is a little bit of tweaking that's required hopefully you've already tweaked your system with the video i put up recently which covers the new windows full creators update and if you have then your system should be working pretty well for audio however with the surface pro 2017 there's something else that you have to do and as i've said uh, many times the cpu within the surface pro is not really designed for music making because the sort of thing that we want is loads and loads of power on all the time that's what we want that's our basic requirement however you are not going to find a cpu which does that within a gorgeous mobile touchscreen environment it's just not going to happen they stick in ultrabook processors and they are designed to shut power down as quickly as possible in order to conserve battery life so we have this dynamic going on where we're trying to sort of battle against that sort of thing back on the service pro 3 that worked really well it's only problems being heat and when it got to a certain thermal level the processor would step down regardless of what you try to do and that could seriously ruin your project on the surface pro 4 the cpu was banging around so much all the time that you just got glitching <laughs> nearly all the time until they fixed that and made it a lot more stable with the surface pro 2017 there's stability up to a point and then there's this lovely space of sort of turbo power which is too erratic to actually make use of 
Let me try to illustrate this. I've got the Intel Extreme Tuning Utility running here, which is just showing us CPU usage and CPU frequency. Now, as I run a test project, the CPU will leap up in order to try to use all of the power available to it within its turbo profile. And you think, that's great. I'm loading up tons and tons of plugins here. And as you can see here, this particular point here, it was up to about 3.3 gigahertz, 3.2, 3.2 gigahertz, which is amazing. And within that space, I could load a ton of plugins and keep on going and keep on going. And then for no suitably explored reason, it just dropped down to 2.6, just like that. I mean, there must be a trigger, but darned if I can find it. And I find that actually it's more likely that it just goes up and down, bit up, bit down, bit up bit down and that's no good <laughs> because if you've loaded plugins within the space of about 3.2 gigahertz once it dropped your audio is going to crackle and disappear because it's not coping with the amount of stuff you've got loaded turbo mode on a processor is designed to do quick tasks and then come back again go off and do something fast and then come back again but we're loading it up to a constant amount of processor usage and that's not what this is designed for so i've got door bench loaded here with a whole load of plugins. If I load that now, we should see the effect of the CPU. So did you see that? That was quite interesting. When I hit play, it leapt up to 3.3, something or other, and playback was fine. And then suddenly it went, oh no this can't be right i can't stay up here because the whole thing will just catch fire so it dropped down again and that killed the playback it went all glitchy that's not good we can't have that because you can't work in that turbo space you can't there's nothing you can do to work in there it's not designed for that i mean particularly the i5 because it's fanless and so needs to retain some kind of sensible level of thermal dynamics so what do we do well there's a very very simple tweak which i found to be extremely effective it's to do with our power settings so if we go power edit power plan that's what we want now we've got it set to high performance we know that another quick tip here that if you weren't able to find high performance when you did my other tweak video press on create a power plan and then the high performance option will become available by the by high performance change plan settings advanced power settings in here, go down to processor power management, minimum and maximum. And you want to set the minimum and maximum to 99%. Genius. Yes, I know. So 99 and here, 99. Hit OK. And what we will find is that the CPU will no longer jump up into that turbo range. It will stay stuck at about 2.56, which is you know, around about the normal operating speed of the processor. Now my project here is loaded with enough plugins to run in 3.3 gigahertz. So it's not going to be able to handle all of these when running at 2.5. So let me dis disable a bunch of these first, otherwise it will just crackle like crazy. Okay, so there's a comfortable amount of plugins. There's still some room here at the end if we go back to our our performance meter here we can see that it's more or less stable it does move a little bit at the moment it's at 2.58 and it sort of goes 2.58 down to 2.4 and up again but not really enough to make a plugins worth of difference whereas when it's wanging itself up to 3.3 and you suddenly find yourself adding more stuff when that crashes back down it's just a disaster so in restricting the processor power to 99%, I'm enabling more stability in the system. I'm preventing turbo mode, yes, so potentially I'm losing some performance, you could say, but I'm gaining a level of stability that wasn't previously there. The other side of that is that I'm not going to overwork the thermals of the system, so it's not going to overheat either. So the net result of all that is that I have a much more stable, predictable and consistent system and that's what you want that is the holy grail of the audio computer so this is doorbench currently running 54 of these uh, realxcom standalone compressors 
multi-band compressors from uh, the people who make Reaper. And I've got one of those inserted onto every track of 40 sine waves. There's then a little musical project which plays along the side so that you can listen to something sensible and see when that crackles. So I've got one whole row of inserts loaded. That's 40 plus another 15, that gives me 55. Let's see how many more I can add before it crackles. Now you can see that the audio performance meter is already up to the maximum and it's now just starting to glitch. So if I bring that back one, let's give it a chance to, to stabilize. So good, that's 61 plugins then. That's my door bench benchmark for this system running that test project on this audio interface. If you use a different audio interface, a different system, that may be different, but that's to give you an idea. Right, let's move on to polyphony. So my polyphony test is very simple. Eight notes, I just wanna hold eight notes going through a polyphonic virtual instrument, hold it for a bit, to see if the CPU for the system can handle it. Then I add another track with another instrument and so on and so on and so on until the thing craps out. I'm gonna to try to do two tests, I think is the plan. One, using internal instruments so that if you have this software, you can repeat what I'm doing. And then to use a selection of perhaps higher quality, more CPU intensive third party plugins like Arturia, Contact, Native Instruments, that sort of thing. So here's my little pattern that I've created. Just goes like this. Simple. If I give you a different instrument like the pad shop one here, And then if I play them all together, you'll see what I mean, and you'll see the audio performance meter climb as those notes are played. So that's Awesome then, it can play, I've got six instruments loaded, the Hallian loaded with the piano, Mystic, Pad Shop, Prologue, Retrologue, and Spectre, all of the internal Cubase instruments. Now if I select them all and simply duplicate them, that'll increase the amount of polyphony it has to do. So currently I've got six channels all playing eight notes, although individually they may be playing more voices than that. But, you know, the, the test, the result I'm trying to get out of here is essentially the number of tracks that are doing this rather than individual note polyphony. But you could say it's six times eight notes, which is 48 note polyphony so far. So let's duplicate this lot. And see how well that runs. So yeah, it's working very easily so far. It's not even got up to you know a third of the processor power at the moment. So let's do another one of those. 24 instruments. So I've got 24 virtual instruments loaded, each playing eight notes. That's pretty good. It's up to past halfway audio performance. Let's keep going. 42, let's go with that. So that is still holding that together. Let's do it one more time. 48. There we go. Okay, we've hit a bit of a limit there at 48 instruments. Now, can I pull it back to normal playback? Well, let's start disabling some of these instruments to see whether I can make that happen.
So it's holding it together at 45. Let me re-enable 46. Let's re-enable 47. Okay, 47 instruments is pushing it then, so 46 it seems to be 46, which of course you know is 368 notes polyphony. So how does that sit for you? I mean, that's 46 virtual instruments. I mean, the ones within Cubase are not massively complex, but also they're decent, you know, representative, I think, of VST instruments that are out there. And so the Surface Pro is coping pretty well with doing polyphonic pads, if you like, on 46 loaded instruments. That's not too bad, that's not too shabby. To spice things up a bit for this last polyphony test, I'm going to use third party VST instruments. The idea being that I can use the same test on all the different doors I use and get some kind of comparison between the different ones. And within this test, I want to mix sample based instruments with CPU based synthesizers to again, to try to replicate some kind of authenticity. So I know that the system can already handle a few dozen instruments. So rather than starting with a small number and duplicating them, I'm gonna go in there with a larger number. So currently I've got eight tracks of contact going on. These are using a string ensemble and Session Strings Pro and also an Alicia Keys piano. So that should be a, a good chunky amount of sample library loaded. Next, I'm gonna load up some Arturia synths. Let's add a CS80. Staying with Yamaha, I'm gonna add a DX7. Jupiter 8. Prophet. An ARP. Farfisa. And I'll round off with a couple of Rob Haven synths. So there you are, I have 16 instruments loaded, eight sample based ones, eight CPU, relatively intensive ones from Arturia and Rob Haben. Let's see how that flies. Now the CPU load is fine, it's over halfway, so if I repeat all of this, it's probably going to go a bit too far. But as it is, it's you know, well within the limits of the specification to run 16 tracks with eight loads of sample library and eight synths all running together, all at the same time, all doing eight note polyphony. That's not bad, that's not bad at all. 30 instruments, 15 of each. Okay, step too far. Let's take a couple of these off. Yeah, that is right on the edge. That's 28. So that's 14 of each. 14 sample based, 14 CPU based. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, that is right on the edge. Maybe 27 is better. So I'll be able to use those same instruments loaded up within other doors like Reason, like Ableton, like Waveform, Studio One, Pro Tools, maybe not Pro Tools as this is VST instruments. Some of them will be available as AAS, but not all of them. But you know, you can't have everything. But I will attempt to use this same sort of project in all of those doors so that we can get some kind of comparison between them and how well they run in compared to the other. Because who knows, there might be massive differences. And we like interesting things. Yes, we do. Well, I hope those performance tests were useful. And I'm going to finish off now by creating like a piece of music in Cubase. I'm just talking about eight bars, an eight bar loop maybe of eight tracks, just some way of using MIDI and audio, using touch and the pen and instruments and stuff just to demonstrate how I would use Cubase when actually making music.
So there you have it, Cubase 9.5 Pro running on the Surface Pro 2017. I hope that's useful. I'm going to be delving into all the other doors now to do some comparable videos to see how well they run on this quite amazing little touch hybrid platform that Microsoft have come up with. I would love to do similar testing on the Surface Book 2, but I don't have any way of getting my hands on one. But if anyone would like to lend me one, then please do get in touch. And if you're interested in making music on the Surface Pro, then do check out my channel. I've got tons and tons of videos on there showing you how to tweak, how to do it, what the audio performance is like, and these videos are gonna keep on coming. And if this is something that inspires and interests you, then do consider supporting me on patreon.com. I've got a Patreon campaign on there where you can throw us a couple of dollars in order to help me keep this kind of content flowing. And there's a bunch of amazing people on there already who are just simply extraordinary but otherwise keep at it keep the comments flowing i always enjoy a good chat underneath the videos and if there's anything you want to talk about is anything you want to know any questions you've got then feel free to ask except the ones about how many plugins you can run of your particular plugin because i've just shown you yeah you take what i've done and apply it to your situation yeah and in the meantime go make some tunes